Mix it up for interesting shape combos today on Beads, Baubles, and Jewels. Beads, Baubles, and Jewels has been brought to you in part by Beading Daily, your jewelry making resource for how-to projects, books, magazines, DVDs, events, and online learning. Beadingdaily.com Beadalon, a manufacturer of flexible bead stringing wires, memory wire, artistic wire, stringing materials, innovative findings, and tools to help you fashion your own jewelry. Beadalon.com Create your style with Swarovski Elements. EKSuccessBrands.com forward slash create your style with Swarovski elements. Halcraft, jewelry component manufacturer. Halcraft.com. Jewel School, a division of jewelry television. JTV.com slash Jewel School. TierraCast, define your design with metal. TierraCast.com. Thinking like a designer means taking some chances and doing the unexpected. Hi, I'm Katie Hacker, and today on Beads, Bobbles, and Jewels, we're mixing shapes and materials for dynamic and eye-catching designs. Mixing it up provides that variation that keeps your eye moving. Our first example is earrings. You can search your stash for interesting combinations like these. So have a look at the earrings that we're going to make today. They're really, really simple combination of materials and techniques, but you can see that some different shapes give them a lot of interest and that color really packs a punch. So let me show you how to get started. The first thing that you do is just make some very simple loops. So you wanna keep in mind that head pins and eye pins are different. And head pins have a flat end or something decorative here on the end. And eye pins have a loop. And these are pre-made, of course you can make your own out of 20 gauge or 18 gauge wire or thicker, but um, it makes it really fast and convenient to use the ones that are pre-made. So when you're mixing shapes together, some things to keep in mind are color, of course, and creating this palette is an easy way because these beads right here are the same type of stone. They're just dyed in different jewel tones. And then these I just chose because I love those fuchsia and purple together with the other tones that we have going on. And I like to do a rectangle or some larger kind of drop at the bottom of the earring just to add some interest. So I just slide it onto the head pin and this is a basic loop, and there are a couple different ways of doing this. One is to just bend the pin against the top of the bead, and then use your wire cutter to cut it to a finger's width. Then pick up your round nose pliers, and grasp it toward the middle of the round nose so that you get a really good grip, and then roll it back. And as you practice making basic loops, those loops will get smaller and smaller because you'll feel more comfortable working out toward the tip of your pliers and you'll be able to make smaller loops. So I say make about a thousand right here at the middle. No, I'm just kidding. Make a whole bunch of loops to practice though because that's the best way to get good at it. Then take your eye pin and you can slide your bead onto the eye pin. Again, bend. Now another technique is to place your loop, your pliers here at the top of the bead and just roll the wire over the top. So there are a couple of different ways to make loops and all the different designers who are here on the show use a different technique. So you're going to see it done a lot of different ways. And you can use your wire cutter, make sure that you turn the flush side of your cutter to the wire and trim. Then use your chain nose pliers to make sure that your loops are nice and secure. Now a basic loop isn't going to be as secure as a wrapped loop, which you'll see in other projects, but it's really fast and quick and convenient. And for lightweight earrings like these, they work just fine. So we'll make one more link with a coin shaped bead. And these are some of my favorite shapes to incorporate because you get that round look without the dimension and sometimes that's nice. So roll this all around, then use your cutter to trim it up. Now when you're linking these together, what I would recommend is to make all of your links at once. Then when you're ready, link them all together. So you'll turn the loop to the side to open it and slide a link onto it. Then close. Of course, this is really simple, but it creates a really stylish look. 
that can work for a lot of different color palettes. And then you can see it's easy to just link it together. Now, one way to add a little bit more color and to bring out the great colors of your beads is to add a little bit of wire to the ear wire. So I just cut a piece of 22, 24 gauge wire and wrap it around the base of the ear wire and you're just making a coil. And I just use my fingers, but you can use pliers to help you get started. Make very tight coil and you can make it any size. And if you wanted to, you could slide a little bead onto there too. And then you can trim this up. And then you can just take your chain nose pliers and squeeze that little coil together to make it tight. And this gives you a nice handmade effect and a pop of color right there on your ear wire. So it makes it uniquely your own. Now, if you take a look at these pink earrings, these are a perfect example of using some different shapes together to create a designer effect. Of course, these are also very long, which creates a statement. And by mixing the shapes, you break up that monochromatic color palette just enough to give the eye a place to rest on each of these differently shaped beads. And I'll show you a couple of other examples of earrings using different kinds of beads. These are all very simple, but when you combine shapes together like this, um, this again is a monochromatic color palette, but you get a designer effect when you put a bead inside of another, when you use bead spacers as bead caps, using a little bit of a wrapped coil instead of a basic link. These are all different ways of creating more of a designer look in your even simplest jewelry designs. The green earrings have a tube bead here at the top and then a little bit of sparkle and a ring at the bottom. So that's the same type of linking project, but used in a different way. And then with the last two necklaces, so I'll start with this long brown one. This one is an example of using the same links to give more drama to the links that look different. So when you're using some different shapes, you kind of punctuate your designs and create more dramatic effects than if they were all the same shape. And then the last necklace has a bead frame as the pendant with a bead inside, and that's one of my favorite techniques. And I used the white beads to reflect the same look as the pendant because they're kind of similar in that square rectangular shape, and then broke it up with random assortment of golds and ambers. And that's a really easy thing to do when you have a bead mix. You can pull from strands and make your own bead mix with different shapes and colors. So we have a great show today. And coming up next, Kristen Robinson with a resin project using bezels and transparencies. Then we'll talk about fitting shapes together as Leslie Rogalski shows us how to stitch flat right angle weave with bicones. And finally, Kate Richberg will lead us through her top techniques for soldering bales onto metalwork. I'll be right back with Kristen. I'm here with designer and author Kristen Robinson. Hi Kristen. Hi Katie. You have a great project today to show us using resin. This bracelet is gorgeous. Thank you very much. You're it's welcome. a fun project to do and it's really quite simple. It seems like it. How do we get started? So the first thing you want to do is choose your bezel and I have an open back bezel here. So what you're going to need to do is back it with some packing tape. And you'll want to make sure that you're using a pretty substantial packing tape with a good amount of stickiness on it. Okay. And fold one end down. Place your bezel onto the packing tape and then fold the other end down. And this is frankly just to have a place to hold on to the, the tape okay. so you're not putting your fingerprints on it. And then I just burnish this slightly with a bone folder. And if you don't have a bone folder, you could use something like an old gift card, um, an old credit card would work. You basically just want to make sure that the tape is making really good contact exactly. with that Exactly. And bezel. you can see this bezel has a lot of open area, so then I just kind of rub it down as well to make sure it's nice and firm. Okay. And then the next step would be to go ahead and measure out some resin. And I have this two-part resin that's in the plunger and you want to take the lid out first. So you just pop that out. And it's pretty important you do that so you don't send it flying across the room. I think you've learned that from experience. Yes, I have. And then you want to go ahead and just trim these ends off and make sure you do so at a level equal amount so that you have an equal amount of resin coming out of the plunger when you plunge it. Oh, just because if you cut the hole too big then on one side it wouldn't be the same amount. Exactly. And my suggestion is not to use your best scissors or um, wire cutters to do that because resin can get into your tools and that's not good. Okay. So just go ahead and plunge. Oh, about one milliliter in here. Right. And I have some that's already mixed. How long are you going to mix this? About two minutes, and it's a folding motion. You don't want to stir it or whip it. Because it would create too many bubbles? Exactly, okay. and even though this is a self-leveling resin and all the bubbles will come to the top, you still don't want to create too much in there. Okay. And then you just kind of pour a little bit in there. 
And I like to use the craft stick to kind of manipulate it and get it to all the edges. And then I would let this dry um, for at least a few hours. And depending on your climate too, that's going to have an effect on it. It's really substantially hard in six hours. Um, but if you have humidity, you might want to even let it sit longer. Okay. So in this step, we already have the resin background on here. So we're going to add some rhinestone chain and the transparency. All right. And all I do is I just typically will print out a whole bunch of images onto one sheet. So I always have them to go to. That makes sense. And that way, if you make a mistake, you don't ruin the one Exactly. One. You're not running back to your printer to reprint it. And you just want to trim this down so it fits in there nicely. And I've done that already. And then I like a little extra support just so when I place my rhinestone chain, it's not going to move around too much once I get the resin in there because the resin could push on it and make that chain kind of go up on the sides. And you really want it to stay in place so it looks nice. Oh, okay. So you use the industrial strength glue I for do. That. And I just add a few little drops with a toothpick. I don't want to put this right on my chain because it could goop it up and then I won't be able to place it real well. Okay. So you're just kind of getting it in there. Whoops. I'm stuck to my and tape. You don't need to glue your resin, or I'm sorry, glue the transparency. No, down. no, because what's going to happen is an air bubble will be created behind the transparency and that other layer of resin, so it will stay in place. And as it's drying, if you find it does float a little bit, you can just take a toothpick and you can press that down as well. Okay. So I'm just going to go ahead and place these around the perimeter of my image. And you could put anything in this. You could put multiple layers of transparencies. That's a really nice look because you get shadows from all the different colors if you're using something with color. I love the idea of adding some more sparkle to it. I'm all about the bling. <laughs> I like the bling and the romantic look that it gives. And then I'm just gonna add a little more resin and you wanna do this rather slowly and methodically. And there, we're just gonna let it do its thing and it will level out. So we're going to pretend this is attached because you really don't want to manipulate this without everything being attached to it and firmly dry. And okay. at that point, you would also take your tape off. And if you have any residue on this, you would just wipe it with a baby wipe. Residue from the tape. From the tape. Mm -hmm. The baby wipe really likes to take the, the tape stickiness off. So I would just place this on my mandrel. And I kind of like to hold it between my forefinger and my thumb. And I just slightly hammer this with my rawhide hammer. And I'm doing it in a slow motion because I really want to be methodical about it and make sure it's going to fit my wrist appropriately. So I just periodically kind of check my progress. Okay, and you wouldn't want to really slam it all at once because you might crack your Exactly, resin. you may crack the resin, and then also if the metal is not a hardened metal, you could crack the metal. Okay. Now let's take a look at your bracelet because you also have some little pearl linkies there. I do. I like to call these ribbon stacks. Would you like to see how to make them? Sure, let's see. Okay. So what you'll need is you'll need an eye pin, you'll need a scrap of ribbon or a piece of ribbon, a pearl, and your round nose pliers because we're going to create another loop at the other end. And okay. you can see I've started according folding this onto the eye pin. And you can use any kind of ribbon you for can. this. You can. You could even use scrap fabric. Hold it right here where we can see. There we go. And then you're just going to want to place this onto the pin. And if you find that your pearl doesn't go on real easy, you can just pull that wire with the pliers and it goes on there a little bit quicker. And then you're just going to want to string the rest of this ribbon on there. And it's really how much ribbon you desire because you are, the wearer is going to wear this. But you don't even need a needle for this. No, you don't. If you had a really thick piece of fabric, then you may want to put some guide holes on there. And then you're just going to create the rest of your wrap loop length there. And obviously you would trim this off. And then what I like to do is I go in and just kind of trim some of the ribbon away. Oh, that gives it such a great romantic look. Let's take one more look at your bracelet. This is so pretty, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back with Leslie Rogalski. I'm here with Leslie Rogalski, and today we're talking about shapes. Leslie, you have a great idea for fitting bicones together. I do, in a couple ways. First thing I want to say is that bicones are great in flat right angle weave because of the conical shape and the way the little corners fit in together. So just in and of themselves, the shapes make other shapes. Isn't that cool? Which is really cool. So I'm going to show you how to take those wonderful shaped bicone crystals using flat right angle weave and then fold them into a three-sided shape. I'm working with an opaque mint crystal and a translucent Pacific opal. Oh, they look so pretty together. And if you're just learning right angle weave, flat right angle weave, or any kind, 
it helps you to keep track of where you are because you can see where the sides of each four bead stitch are. Oh, what a good tip. So I have started to make a column here and the project that I'm gonna show you uses a row, rows of three. Cubic right angle weave or flat right angle weave works clockwise and counterclockwise through the four beads. You always wanna remember that you're working in a circle. So now I know that the sides are gonna be the opaque beads and the middle is the translucent bead. So I'm going to pick up one. Okay, I should it, be able to pick that up. Sure. <laughs> Does it matter what type of needle you're using? You always wanna choose a size needle that fits the size of the bead hole. And crystals can accommodate um, a size 10 or a 12. Okay. And sometimes the eye of the needle gets small for beading thread if you're using too thin a needle. So there's kind of a balance between the size of the bead hole and the dimension of your thread, the gauge of your thread. So here I have my three beads and you learn to share and beads learn to share in right angle weave. So I'm gonna go back around through the bead that's already stitched. So just to make that circle. To just to make that circle. Now I wanna continue around my circle because I wanna start another column. Yes, and I think that's the tricky part. It is, you, you have to, to remember to step up. So I'm going to pass through two beads that I just added. The side and the top, sometimes they're referred to as the walls and the floor oh, and the ceiling. Sense. Oh, that makes sense, yeah. So, Okay, now I'm gonna want my next column to come down here, so I'm going to pass, a, continue around the circle and come through the mint bead. Now I'm ready to start my next column and I know that the bottom bead is gonna be the translucent bead and the side bead is gonna be the opaque bead and the top bead is gonna be another translucent bead, so I'm picking up three to start my next row. Mm -hmm. Just like this. That makes sense. And you know, I, I notice you're using matching thread too. Yes, when I use translucent crystals or beads, it's nice to use a thread that's not gonna show very much. So here I've come through and you really can't see the thread. I'm gonna pass through this next crystal and continue picking up two beads at a time till I reach the bottom and then I'm gonna make my third column doing the three bead turnaround. Here's a piece that's finished. Okay. Now comes the fun part, because now we're gonna take the shapes and make another shape. All right. And you're gonna fold the walls or the side beads together. And again, the two tones really oh, helps really, you if you're starting. Oh yeah, we can see right where those belong. You know exactly that you need to pick up one of the clearer translucent beads. And that's gonna become yeah, so it just the third right of the fourth, and you're gonna pick up another one and go around and keep continuing around clockwise, counterclockwise, adding just those clear beads until you end up with this. Great, now when you finish it, do you tie it or do you just weave your thread back through or how do you? You can do an, any number of things. You can weave back through to where your tail is and make a discreet knot and then weave the threads in. Or if you have a long enough working thread, you can continue to add embellishment. And that's what I'm gonna oh, show you okay. here. So I like to use cylinder beads and I'm going to work them in between, sometimes called stitch in the ditch. I love all these, the crystals. we're getting some insider lingo here today. <laughs> stitch in the ditch. Yes. That comes from the world of sewing, as many of us do. Now the thing about using cylinders is they do have a direction and a specific shape again, so I want all my cylinder holes to be parallel. And the way I do that is to make sure when I pass through my crystal that I'm gonna pick up a cylinder bead between each crystal and work my way around going in the same direction and then work down to the next row. It's almost like stepping up. So if this row was all stitched like this, now I have to pass through to the next row of oh, opaque cylinders. Oh yeah, so that cylinders. it's in the right position Yes, there. plus you don't wanna pick up a cylinder just yet because it's gonna pull the bead out of position. You wanna make sure that your needle is already going in the direction you need to go and then start to string. You're almost creating a fabric of beads here. It's always like that. Bead weaving, bead stitching, and you're gonna continue around adding your embellishment uh, seed beads all the way through to end up with a unit that looks like this. Great. To make earrings, thread another accent crystal on a head pin I chose to use four millimeter bicones again because it snuggles right in there. Then you can add another crystal, wire wrap loop, 
add your ear wire, voila. There's and your first earring. You're ready. Okay, let's look at these because this is so, this is very similar technique but using smaller beads. And I reversed the colorway so you can see the drama that's created using the all black. Bicones again, they snuggle right up to each other. The larger pair of earrings, I've used those beautiful indicolite oh, yes, I color beads color. with crystal pearls instead of the seed beads. So it makes a really nice embellishment. And why stop at just an inch for earrings when you can make a whole cuff if you want? You can, you can continue the triad weave to make an entire cuff, or of course you could make a rope that would go around your neck as it's just an absolutely gorgeous collar. Oh yes, I love that cuff, and it's nice and flat against the inside too. Because so you that can wear third it side, because you have that triangular shape. Oh, that's, these are some great ideas. Thank you so much, Leslie. You're welcome. We will be right back with Kate Richberg. I'm here with author and designer Kate Richberg, and Kate is known for her metal work, and she's created this wonderful sampler of techniques. And once you work your way through the different techniques, you'll be able to make almost anything, right, Kate? That's right. And today we are going to learn how to attach a jump ring, that's, solder the jump ring. That's right. That's one of the questions I get most often from my students is, how do I solder a jump ring? Well, it's so practical. Uh, and it's so easy, and I'm going to show you. Okay. Okay. So I start, we need to start actually by making the jump ring. So and you, so, is this sterling wire? It is sterling okay. silver wire. Again, I could use any um, jewelry metal, but the sterling silver is nice to work with. And then I go ahead and I create that, uh, this is 18 gauge wire that I have here. Again, you could use any gauge. But I go ahead and I make a little coil of rings. And I can use um, the small barrel of my wrap and tap plier, I could use a mandrel, um, a knitting needle, anything that I want to wrap that wire around. Then I go ahead and I want to use a flush cutter to cut the rings. So I'm going to grab my coil, I'm going to use the flush side of the cutter, and I'm just going to make a little cut here, nice and even across, like so. Now you need to make sure to flip the cutter so that the flush side of the cutter is towards the usable side of the ring. So your two flush ends fit really nicely together. Exactly, and that's one of the golden rules of soldering is that you have to have two completely flush sides so they come together so there's no gap in between them. Okay. Now let's attach the ring to the little tile here. I'm gonna take my jump ring, put it through the hole that I've made in the tile, and I'm going to use two pliers to close this up. I'm going to use just this flat nose plier and my chain nose plier. And I'm going to come in and just go ahead and work that little ring back and forth. And as I work that ring back and forth, it work hardens the opposite side of the ring. So you're making it nice and strong. Exactly. And I bring that together nice and flush. There's no gap in there. Great. So now, one of the tips I like to give, one of the secrets to getting a perfectly soldered jump ring is I like to come in and see how I have this little divot that I've made yes. in my kiln brick. And this brick. is your kiln brick that will protect your work surface. Exactly. That's my soldering surface is my kiln brick. And I lay the tile so it's sitting up in that little divot and that makes my jump ring sit flat. So handy. So handy and it makes it nice and easy to solder that ring. Now I'm going to use easy paste solder and the paste solder, uh, the easy solder flows very quickly, very easily, and this paste solder already has flux in it. And it's durable enough for this type of connection. Exactly. Uh, I'm just going to put a little piece right on there. And I'm using, this is about uh, the size of a size 11 seed bead. That's the amount that you want to get. Exactly, that I want to get on there. Sometimes it's a little stubborn, but you're the boss of that solder, so you just tell the solder where to go. There we go. There you got it. And it's right on the join. Okay. Okay. So now let's fire up the torch, but before we do, safety, safety first. first. Let's put on those safety glasses. Got it. And I'm using a butane torch, just a, a butane micro torch. Very easy and safe to use. We want to make sure that we're using it in a well ventilated area and that we have a fire extinguisher nearby. Okay. But I'm going to go ahead and fire this up. And I'm just going to ignore the tile and focus my flame on that jump ring. I'm just going to turn this so we can see it a little bit. Sure. I'm going to follow you with that torch. There we go. Oh, let's go the other way. Okay. How about that? 
perfect, and okay. I can see it too. Okay, good. <laughs> Excellent. So let's get down in there with the torch, and I slowly introduce the flame of the torch, and I'm getting a little closer. You're going to see that flux smoke a little bit from the, uh, the solder, but that's no big deal. And you can see it's starting to get cherry red. And see, there we go. The solder's flowed like and a little there it piece went. Mm -hmm, of liquid mercury. And then That's we quench it. this. We go ahead and quench it and pickle it in uh, with pickle or your cleaning method of choice. And then you're done. And you're done. You're ready for a pendant. This a is so solder great. Jump ring. Oh, thank you so much, Kate. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us today. Make sure you visit us on Facebook with ideas for future episodes. And next time we feature frames as a highlight for special treasures. I hope to see you then. Instructions for today's projects, plus other ideas, techniques, and information are available on the web at beadsbobblesandjewels.com. Today's show is number 1704. If you enjoyed today's show and want to see more projects and great guests, you can order a DVD set of the entire Beads, Bobbles, and Jewels series 1700. All 13 episodes plus bonus content featuring soldering techniques with Kate Richbord and Spiral Herringbone with Jean Campbell, only available in this DVD set. Order at beadsbobblesandjewels.com for $29.99 plus shipping and handling. Don't miss a single episode and get these bonus projects. Beads, Bobbles, and Jewels has been brought to you in part by Beading Daily, your jewelry making resource for how-to projects, books, magazines, DVDs, events, and online learning. Beadingdaily.com. Beadalon, a manufacturer of flexible bead stringing wires, memory wire, artistic wire, stringing materials, innovative findings, and tools to help you fashion your own jewelry. Beadalon.com. Create your style with Swarovski elements. EKSuccessBrands.com forward slash create your style with Swarovski elements. Halcraft, jewelry component manufacturer. Halcraft.com. Jewel School, a division of jewelry television. JTV.com slash Jewel School. TierraCast, define your design with metal. TierraCast.com.